Bobby. Time haven't arrived. Uh, Tuesday, April 22nd, 7 p.m. Standing uh, Committee on Finance. I call to order, please. Uh, before we uh, go into the agenda items, a uh, couple just uh, pieces of information. We got notification that um, uh, DPW Commissioner Mike Thorson can't be here tonight. Uh, Superintendent of Water uh, Larry Rowley cannot be here tonight. And uh, our colleague, Councilor from Ward 2, uh, Tom Monahan, is unable to attend. Uh, Madam Clerk. Appointment, Kenneth Galligan to the Brockton Zoning Board of Appeals for a three-year term ending March 2017, invited Kenneth Galligan. Good evening, Chief. How are you tonight? Good evening, Councilors. Do you have a statement for us? Yes, I'd like to thank the Mayor for putting my name in for reappointment to the Zoning Board of Appeals, and I look forward to uh, another three years serving on the board. Motion, Motion to approve. Second. Motion is made properly. Second, favorable recommendation back to the full City Council. If you're in favor, please raise your hand. If you're opposed, raise your hand. Motion carries. Favorable recommendation. Thank you, Chief. Thank you, Council. Have a good evening. Number two, Madam Clerk. Appointment, Robert Pelagi as an alternate to the Brockton Zoning Board of Appeals for a three-year term ending March 2017, invited Robert Pelagi. Pelagi, good evening. Good evening, Council. Do you have a statement for us, or? Uh, good evening, Councilors. Yes, uh, I'd like to thank the Mayor for his uh, consideration to this appointment uh, to the zoning, as an alternate to the Zoning Board of Appeals. Motion to recommend favorably. Second. Second. Motion was made. It was a proper second. It's a favorable recommendation back to the full city council. In favor, please raise your hand. If you're opposed, raise your hand. Motion carries. Thank you, Mr. Plodgy. Thank you. Have a good evening. Number three, uh, Council uh, Cruz. I, I, we received word that Mr. Marciano couldn't be here, but uh, after you read it, I will make a motion to recommend favorably with his strong service as a member of this body. You want to take three through six? Uh, take motion to make uh, items three through six uh, collectively. Second. Sorry. Motion was made to take uh, agenda items three through six collectively. All in favor, please raise your hand. All opposed. Motion carries. Madam Clerk, three through six collectively, please. Appointment. Peter Marciano as an alternate to the Brockton Zoning Board of Appeals for a three-year term ending March 2017. <coughs> Appointment of Mark Norwood to the Brockton Conservation Commission for a three-year term ending March to, I'm sorry, April 2017, invited Mark Norwood. Appointment of Peter Saganis to the Planning Board of five-year term ending April 2019. An appointment of Lisa Shade to the Brockton C Cable Advisory Board for a three-year term ending March 2017. Are any of the uh, invited guests in attendance here tonight? Mark Norwood is. If, if, come forward if you, if, you, if you choose to come forward just so we can kind of put a a name with a face. That's Mark Norwood, yeah. Okay, I think it's a dress room. Good evening, sir. Peter Sakanis. Sakanis, how are you tonight? Fine. Thank you for joining us. Pardon? Thank you for joining us this okay. evening. My Do pleasure. Motion to recommend favorably. Second. Do you have a statement you want to make for us, sir, or? No, I've lived in okay. Brockton all my life. Excellent. I was on a conservation. Commission and the uh, the other one there, the small one, I forget, but I enjoyed it. Uh, now that I'm now that I have some spare time, I'd like to give it back to Brockton. Thank you. We appreciate that, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you again, Mr. Connors. I'd like to thank the city of Brockton and the mayor for um, appointing me asking me to be part of the Conservation Commission. Um, having lived in Brockton and both uh, growing up here and ran a, uh, started a business, continue to run a business in Brockton, um, I feel like it would be a good asset to the Conservation Commission. And being a landscape company, um, I have quite a passion for the environment, and I think I'll be able to bring a new perspective to the commission. Um, Thank you, Mr. Excited. Norwood. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much. Mr. Mr. Chairman, Mike. Oh, <coughs> Council Stadensky. Uh, just to, to bring up, uh, to the clerk, uh, Mr. N uh, Norwood, you live at 101 Sumner Street, correct? Yes, that's correct, sir. Okay, can you make that? Uh, and, and there is no West Brockton. There's a West there. No, it's we Sumner usually Street say West. Sumner Street West, West so Street people West. don't get it mixed Thank up. Thank you very much. Move to approve. Second. Motion was made properly seconded for uh, uh, numbers three through six collectively. <laughs> favorable recommendation back to the full city council. If you're in favor, please raise your hand. If you're opposed, the motion carries. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Have a good night. Madam Clerk, number seven, please. Reappointment, Stephen Bernard of 130 Highland Street to the Brockton Zoning Board of Appeals for a three-year term ending March 2017. Invited Stephen Bernard. Good evening, Mr. Bernard. 
Councilors and uh, Mayor, it's been a pleasure to uh, serve on the Zoning Board of Appeals for the last several years, and I appreciate being uh, nominated to serve again. Motion to recommend favor. Second. Second. Motion made, properly seconded, favorable recommendation of Mr. Bernard, reappointment back to the full city council. If you're in favor, please raise your hand. Thank you very much. If you're opposed, motion carries. Thank you, Mr. Bernard. Madam Court, <coughs> number eight, please. Reappointment James Cassiri to the position of Superintendent of Building for the City of Rockton for a three-year term ending April 2017. Invited James Cassiri. Cassiri, good evening. Good evening. Hello, Councils. I have no statement other than to say uh, thank the Mayor for reappointing me, and I hope for a favorable recommendation from you. Motion to recommend favorably. Second. On the motion, actually. On the motion, Councilor. Thank you. I have, actually, actually, Mr. Cassiri, good to see you. Two questions for you. Um, What's your most um, notable accomplishment in your previous term? And then what are your goals for the next term? My most notable accomplishment is, um, I would say there's a few things, but one that stands out and has been very useful is the fact that I think that we're probably the most diverse uh, department in the building other than the mayor's office right now. We have a uh, Cape Verdean clerk who's Cape Verdean speaking. We also have a Spanish speaking clerk and it's been very helpful to our department. And uh, in fact, a lot of the other departments utilize those services as well. So I think that was uh, one good one there. So I've made some good hires. Okay, excellent. Yeah. And then and moving forward, what are, you, what are your sort of top priorities in your next term? Um, I want to expand on the, the vacant building registry and try to clean up the vacant properties. And um, I'm very happy that uh, we're going to start auctioning some of these properties off. That's going to be helpful. But I look forward to cleaning up. We have uh, a lot of funds in that account right now that uh, we'll be able to use to uh, help improve the neighborhoods. Great. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Councilor. Motion was made, a proper second uh, reappointment of Mr. Casiri. It's a favorable recommendation back to the full city council. If you're in favor, raise your hand, please. If you're opposed, raise your hand. Motion carries. Thank, Thank you, you Councilors. Madam Clerk. Reappointment Martin Brophy to the position of Treasurer Tax Collector for the City of Brockton for a term of three years ending April 2017. Invited Martin Brophy. Good evening, Mr. Brophy. Good evening, Councilors. I uh, just wish to thank the Mayor for offering me up for a reappointment. Motion to recommend favorably. Second. Second. Motion was made. On the motion. On the motion. Uh, similar question. Uh, I'm curious about the challenges in your department. I know you are in your, I believe your second term, correct? Having This would be uh, working in the office oh, almost 12 and a half years at this point, uh, between being the assistant and the treasurer collector. This would be my second appointment. Yes. Second appointment is treasurer, correct? So when you took over the office, um, what, were, what were the major challenges that you were able to to, to overcome in that new well, position? Well, actually, um, I kind of started implementing some stuff as the assistant. Um, it was taking over in the treasurer's office. I had imp implemented quite a bit um, just in how the office ran, uh, just the day-to-day -day operation of taking in the monies from other departments. Collector's office, I actually did quite a bit of change um, as far as scheduling in the office and how the window works. Uh, we've actually created, put a drop box outside the office, which uh, in the busy days of the bills, you can have people drop a check in there and they're out of the building in five minutes as opposed to half hour, 45 minutes. Um, we've, before as the assistant, I was part of setting up the online payment system. Uh, we're again working to increase that as well. Um, I have a question, and then what, what part, so there's some city services that you can pay online, there's some that are not, that you can't Correct. pay online. Who, make, who makes that decision? Um, part of it is, I mean, actually all the bills I really collect, uh, for the most part, can be paid online. Mm -hmm. uh, real estate, personal property, um, motor vehicle, water sewer, they're all online. Um, it's a lot of the fees and permits that really aren't online, which aren't part of the collector's office. I see, okay. And, and do departments exchange sort of best practices so those services that are not online could get online? Is, is, what's the stumbling block for the other services, do you know? It depends on the department. I mean, the building, the building department, Mr. Kazarian, is part of trying to get, get getting permits online. Mm -hmm. uh, there's challenges on all of it because you need the piece of paper for the permit. Um, if you try and put dog licenses online, I mean, you need to 
come in and register your dog, you have to show the rabies certificate. Uh, you know, you handed a, a little tag to put on your dog. I mean, each department would have their own, you know, challenge as to what and how it would work. Okay. I know the mayor has committed to working with the IT department to try to move us into this century in terms of that kind Actually, of Actually, the collector's office was the first one to do it mm -hmm. between real estate, um, the water sewer, and mm -hmm. the excise. And then what are you working on for your next, for your new term? What's sort of your, your big, the big goal that you're hoping to accomplish? My goal in the treasurer's office is always to make sure the payrolls are out in a timely manner and everybody gets paid. Uh, the account's payable, all the vendors get paid in a timely manner. Um, up there we deal with the delinquent taxes, so we put on an aggressive approach um, of turning it over to an attorney based on the amount of what's in tax title. Um, that was one of the things I changed up there. My predecessor would go through a complete year of a tax title. Um, I've actually taken multiple years across a line and said, okay, $20,000, let's turn it over to an attorney, and it's amazing how much money. Um, I could send them letter after letter, but it's amazing when an attorney's letter had <laughs> arrived. Right. They're in the office, they're dealing with us, and you know we're collecting current taxes as well as past due. Um, okay. Collector's office, it's always to collect as much as we can. I see. Great. Okay. Well, I really appreciate um, the responses. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Councilor Rodriguez on the motion. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Brophy, uh, thank you for being here tonight. Uh, I've got a quick question for you because one of the, uh, one of the biggest complaints that I remember from my days in the mayor's office and throughout the years and being associated with the city is the lack of diversity in the tax collecting office. Mm -hmm. um, just to be as blunt as I possibly can be, um, if I was to send my grandmother to pay her tax bills, she probably wouldn't be able to do that. And, it, and the tax department, I see it not as the welfare office because we're not giving anything out, we're actually collecting. Mm -hmm. So are there any plans to diversify the office a little bit and not just diversify but have language skills diversity in the sense so that the grandmothers, the aunts and uncles of at least the major languages in this community are able to come down and pay their tax bills? Well, Councillor, right now I don't have any openings down there. Uh, I mean, we just filled one not too long ago. Um, again, we get a piece of paper. Some people put language skills on there. Uh, you're basically looking at a piece of paper. I mean, you wind up with like, so many applications right now and resumes because so many people are out of work. We interviewed, I think, 10 people. Um, it was a diverse group, and I hired the best person, um, and they don't actually speak a second language, but I have to deal with some skills as far as taking in cash, balancing a cash draw. I mean, I can't just... They have to have computer skills. Uh, we, at one point, hired someone who had no computer skills, and it didn't work out all that well in the collector's office. Um, so there are, it's a tough office because you need people as well to be able to handle a, a large amount of cash and a lot of transactions. But I mean, in terms of efforts, you know, I'm Counselor, just saying. I, I, would, I go through every resume. We look at what skills they have, and we interview people. If that person happens to be you know, you don't, you don't a think minority, then we'd certainly hire them if that was the best candidate. I'm, I'm not saying minority. I'm saying language skills. Again, uh, also, some people put language skills on it. If it's there, we've interviewed people who've had language skills. But when, you were, when you're putting out a job description, for instance, and I'm not saying for you to get rid of people that you have working for you, because that's not what I'm saying. I'm mm -hmm. saying as positions become available, in an effort to diversify the office so that you're actually able to handle the language necessities of this city, can we have, can we put forth an effort to basically make a language requirement on those applications? I don't know because, that. That's because a question for personnel. I, I, I honestly don't know the answer to that. I mean, you could put on there that it would be preferred, but I don't think it can be a requirement. No, it doesn't have to be required, but I mean, if we make an effort to basically say, I see applications like that every day where you're looking at you prefer to have this, you prefer to have this, you prefer to have that. I mean, somebody comes in and you want to make sure that they have this skill, this skill, this skill. You can actually say, I prefer to, to hire somebody that because you need it. It's not like you, to, right. you can There's teach somebody, skills, you can teach somebody, you can teach somebody to balance the books, but it, you know, you can't really teach somebody to be culturally diverse. So what I'm saying is that for us as a city, and, and as a government in the sense, to put a little more effort into getting 
the right diversity into the city so that we can benefit also, the all next the time citizens. I have a, an opening, we'll make sure it's on that its language skills would be preferred. Thank you, sir. Motion to approve. Second. Motion was made properly seconded uh, for a favorable recommendation of the reappointment back to the full city council. If you're in favor, please raise your hand. If you're opposed, that motion carries. Thank you, Mr. Brophy. Madam Clerk. Order, transfer 15,900 from the finance department personal services other than overtime to the mayor's personal services other than overtime in order to fund a budgeting shortfall. This funding will allow the mayor's office to avoid any further staff furloughs uh, subsequent to Friday, April 25, 2014. Invited Honorable Mayor Bill Carpenter, John A. Condon, Chief Financial Officer. Mr. Condon, good evening. Good evening, good evening, counselors. Uh, this is a request for using a surplus in, uh, in my office because of a staff vacancy to transfer to the mayor's office. The intent of it is, as the order reads, that we could avoid any further uh, of the staff furloughs, which have been occurring for about a month now. Uh, it would mean that everybody could begin working five days a week at the end of this, this week if the council is willing to do it. Uh, there's one person in the office who is no longer being paid out of the mayor's office because she's being paid by a grant vacancy that will last until the end of the fiscal year. From then on, she'd have to come back into the mayor's office. But for the balance of the year, her salary is being paid by a grant, and it assumes that the salary of a uh, newbie is to be paid 75% by the cable revolving fund. So that's the request, and uh, we're hopeful that you'll uh, approve it. Motion to approve. Second. I have a question. On the motion, Councilor. I just have a question. Um, this has come up a few times about the same issue. How often do offices um, request funds from other offices or, or other departments to request funds from other departments? Well, uh, typically, if there's a need that arises that wasn't uh, established at the time the budget was put mm -hmm. together, which is the case in, in this particular request, we'll look to see if there are surpluses in other departments. In order for this to work, the department which has the appropriation which is being used needs to indicate to the city council that that amount of money is available for a transfer. And then it takes an eight, uh, an eight vote majority of the council to approve a transfer. But it's usually after the budget has been established if a need comes up that wasn't anticipated. Okay. Are there no other departments or offices that have had this surplus that yours seems to have? Uh, I think we have used some other offices surpluses. I don't. I, I didn't look at that before I came tonight, Council. I'm not sure if I could speak specifically. I know the unemployment budget in the personnel department has been used, right. and in this particular case, there's been a vacancy that was budgeted for the year, and the position isn't filled at this time. There may be other vacancies in other departments. If the money isn't used, it will become surplus at the end of the year and be become part of the free cash calculation. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, a question for Mr. Condon. So um, I'm assuming that if this is not a, if this isn't approved, we have city employees who are not working full time and therefore they're not putting in full time services to the, to the residents of the city, correct? That's correct. They're working without pay for one day a week. There are two people who are continuing to be paid for the full week. Obviously, the mayor who has to be in the, uh, in the secretary of the office administrator. The rest of them are taking one day a week as a furlough. If this isn't approved, then we'll have to take additional action for the balance of the year because there's only so much money in the budget. All right. And then once again, the, the $15,000, here is money within the... So we're not asking for additional money above what was already approved in last year's budget, correct? No, sir. It's just being transferred from a surplus. Okay. All right. Thank you, Mr. Condon. Uh, just one more go back, actually, just off of um, something that, that I just heard. So it's on the motion again. Sorry. Yep. Thank you, sir. Um, so if this is if this is not approved, the employees would still have to work. They just wouldn't get paid for that day. No, they won't work. Uh, they okay. don't. They That's don't what I work. To be clear. They're they're not working and they're not paid. And okay. I, I think in addition to that, I think the mayor will have to take a look at, I don't think that a day, a week of furlough uh, for the number, the individuals who are being furloughed now for the balance of the year would be, be sufficient, sufficient. Right. to cover this amount of money. He'll have to make some additional decisions. Okay. Thank you. Councilor, the motion was made. Councilor Yaneri. <clears throat> just on the motion, if I might, to Mr. Chairman. So, Mr. Condon, just so I have it clear in my mind, with this 15900 pretty much puts in place um, the staffing level that the mayor has within his office, correct? I mean, everything would be in place and it'd be continuing on until we see the budget come July to if there'd be any differences, correct? That's correct. Okay. That's okay. correct. That's what, I just want to have that clear because I, I, I mean, it, it's been a up and down roller coaster to, to what we, you know, what 
we've been doing, what he's been trying to do. Um, not necessarily do I totally agree with it totally, but I, I don't think it's, it's on our best behalf to keep playing the roller coaster ride and let's just wait and see how the budget shakes out for July 1st. I think that's that would be my recommendation, my Council, because you'll get a crack at the entire budget in just a few weeks. Right. I don't know if it was moved to approve, but if not, it I'll was, second Councilor. It, it was. was. Okay, second. Motion was made, properly second, favorable recommendation back to the full City Council. All in favor, please raise your hand. All opposed, please raise your hand. Motion carries. Favorable recommendation back to the full City Council. Madam Clerk, number 11, please. Order transfer of 75000 from the overlay surplus fiscal year 2007 to the Police Department Personal Services Overtime for fiscal year 2000 and I think I was supposed to say 14, not 15, for additional police patrols this fiscal year. Invited Honorable Mayor Bill Carpenter, John A. Condon, Chief Financial Officer, Robert Hayden, Interim Chief of Police. Good evening, Mr. Mayor. Good evening, Mr. President, Councilors. Uh, <clears throat> this is... Uh, this was submitted simultaneously with the request for overtime for the fire department a couple weeks ago. I believe in deference to Chief Francis, you suspended the rules last week and uh, approved the fire department overtime. Uh, this is from the same source of funds, the 2007 uh, overlay for uh, tax abatements. And uh, the specifically, and, uh, Chief Hayden apologizes for not being able to be here. He was called out of town unexpectedly late in the afternoon. Um, but uh, this, this money is specifically earmarked for additional patrols. Um, we are uh, trying to respond as effectively as we can to the violence of the past couple weeks. And uh, this money would be earmarked for uh, additional patrols. And we Thank ask you, for a favorable Mayor. recommendation. Thank you. Mr. President. Uh, Councilor Dubois. Thank you. Uh, good evening. Good evening, Councilor. Mayor Carpenter, nice to see you. Great to see you. Um, it's nice to see you, but I want to see Chief Francis. I understand that he is called out of town, Chief but you know, we're yeah. Chief, Chief, Chief Hayden. Hayden, I'm sorry. Yep. We're going on his second emergency appointment and we still haven't heard really a word out of him. So I filed an, uh, a resolve to have him come in and give us an update on how things are going because with all due respect, you're not a police officer. No, I, I understand. And I would really like to know from the chief that you appointed what he's doing, what he's going to do with this money. I hope that they're going to be walking beats in the village, which I had a conversation with him, mm -hmm. and he said that he would do, and I appreciate that. But I really think that we need to actually see the person that's running the department sure. speak for his own department. Yep, that's not a problem. He's been here frequently, and I'll do everything I can to ensure he's here at the next FinCon. Yeah, meeting. no offense, but he's only been here with rallying. He's not been right. here to speak, and I think right. we really do need to hear him speak. It's so going I, on. It's going on 90 days now of an emergency and, appointment and we still have not heard a word from from the in, from the emergency appointment chief about what's going on in the department I think that uh, I just so I know if you're aware but there were some significant increased patrols in the village over the weekend and particularly last night we had a yep. large contingent of both uh, Brockton and state police in the village last <laughs> night so I think he is listening to your requests uh, uh, specific to that neighborhood in Ward 6. Um, I think the chief has been extremely accessible in general and public, and um, I'm sure that uh, it's, it's not an issue to make sure he's here for your next I spoke step. to him on the Fincom. telephone, on my cell phone. We've had conversations about the needs in the village in different areas. Mm -hmm. I saw him at the bunny rabbit photo op, <laughs> which was great. But, I mean, I just, I think that we... You know, we're going to hear from him in two weeks when we at, when I when my ordin when my resolve gets filed to have him come in and give us an update. But Absolutely. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Council Cruz. Thank you. Uh, my question is actually not for you, Mr. Mayor, but for Mr. Okay. Condon. Okay. Um, so I forget what did we use 175 last week. Uh, to, do we what do we use for the fire department out of this fund? I'm sorry. Uh, how much should we use for the fire department? 175,000 dollars is used for the fire department. And 75. Uh, how much was in that overlay account? Well, the amount that was in the overlay account was probably close to three million dollars at the time it was established. It's established every year when the tax uh, out of the taxes that were that are levied, uh, about two and a half percent is held back for purposes of abatements and exemptions. Over the years, uh, as those abatement and exemption applications either get granted or contested and cleared. The overlay uh, is examined by the assessors to see if there's a balance, and the balance in this particular year was three hundred and forty-five thousand dollars. That was available for you to use. Yes. Okay, that's what I want to find out. So, okay, one seventy-five, two fifty. So, if there was an emergency, there's even a little bit left in in there. Yes, the mayor's actually submitted a request for the balance of it to, to go on the next council agenda again for police overtime. He's looking to increase the number of patrols available. Okay. 
Okay, thank you. Thank you, Council. Council Stadensky. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good evening, Jay. Uh, if I could, Jay, I couldn't quite hear you on. What is the overlay? Well, the, the overlay, quick. it's it's basically um, uh, jargon for something called the reserve for abatements and exemptions. And that reserve is under the control of the Board of Assessors. Uh, they establish it each year out of each year's tax levy because every year there are going to be people who come in and say I'm being overtaxed, I'm deserving of abatement, and some people are granted abatements by the board, others they contest it, and it ends up at the appellate tax board, which makes a decision. In addition to that, there are people who statutorily <coughs> are entitled uh, upon application to exemptions, and that's a reduction in their taxes. So that amount of money, it's usually about 2.5% of the particular year's levy, is pulled out of the levy. It's put aside before it gets spent uh, for the purpose of granting these abatements and exemptions. And as time goes on, the case is clear. This is fiscal 2007. The years subsequent to that, 08, 09, et cetera, still have cases pending so they can't declare a surplus. But this particular year, we asked for an examination. They took a look at it and they said 345,000 is available for appropriation. But it's a reserve out of the tax levy of each year. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Council. Council Bonds. Uh, yes. So uh, if my math is correct, there's 85,000 left after. I think 95. 95? Oh, yeah, I knew it wasn't. Okay. So um, this, the funding from the fire that was given, the 175, and then this proposed 75. Yes. That will last through? This fiscal year. This fiscal year. Okay. Um, I actually had a question on, on how that how all that works, but uh, uh, that's okay. Thank you. Okay. No, actually, no, I do. <laughs> With the 95 that's left, what happens to that? Does that roll over again, or or can maybe they come back and ask for more if they realize that? Well, the the overlay surplus that's been declared that's the overlay exists. It's set aside when it right. isn't spent. The assessors themselves are able to declare an overlay surplus. Right. Once it's declared, that amount of money is available until it's fully spent. So it can cross fiscal years, uh, but if the mayor requests and the council grants this expenditure plus another 95000 for the police department, which I think is being submitted for the next council, this account will have been exhausted. Be gone. Oh, so there's another 95 that will yes, be? Yes, the mayor is hoping to have another one, uh, another appropriation. He, as I said, I think he said he's looking to get aggressive with the number of patrols out there this, uh, this spring to try to get ahead of what's been going on. So the 75 will not hold? over time to the end of the year, fiscal year? Uh, it, it is what was requested a week or so ago. And right. since then, the mayor's looking to even additionally boost up the number of patrols. OK. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Council. Council Yaneri. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Condon, if we transfer this $75,000, does that mean at some point, 30 or 40 days from now, I'm going to see any other type of a transfer? From that account? Yes. Regards to overtime for fiscal year 2015. Uh, in the police department, I believe with the request that the mayor is making for the balance, there will be, that will be the end of the request for this fiscal year. This amount that's in front of me right now? No, and no. Another, another 95. Another 95. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> Could you, yeah, if you, if, if you could, Mayor, yes, appreciate it. Sure. The request in front of you was part of the request sent up two weeks ago, 175 for fire and 75 police that was submitted jointly a couple of weeks ago. Uh, Chief Francis advised me that we were looking at shutting down two engine companies if he did not receive that overtime funding request. He actually requested 200000 I squeezed him for 175 at the same time, I requested the 75 for the police department based upon um, patrols that Chief Hayden had scheduled at that time a couple weeks ago. In light of the events of the past 10 or 12 days, three murders in the city, a couple of other shootings and stabbings, uh, we've been meeting constantly looking to see what the proper response is from the city to ensure the safety of the residents of the city. I think that us collectively, the council and the mayor, I don't think we have any greater responsibility than to ensure the safety of the residents of the city. Uh, based upon a meeting uh, Sunday morning uh, at police uh, headquarters with the chief and members of the state police and the detectives bureau, uh, we uh, developed, began developing a plan that was finalized this morning. We met with um, Major 
Thomas, mm -hmm. uh, who's the uh, Area B commander for the state police. Uh, and uh, we worked out a plan to increase visibility, increase patrols, and based upon the advice of both Major Thomas and Chief Hayden, to get some extra officers on the street at critical times in critical areas. And these are specifically around moving um, the gang unit back to an impact shift of 7 p.m. to 3 a.m., increasing the minimum staffing on the midnight shift, and making sure we're fully staffed on the weekends. And uh, in, in addition to our commitment, and in part with our commitment, we also received a significant commitment from the state police to commit additional resources to the city of Brockton. And you'll see that also. Major Thomas oversees the CAT team, the community action team. And as a joint effort with Brockton making this commitment, he has committed to the same thing, keeping uniform state police uh, patrol units in the city until 3 a.m. on the weekends, increasing the number of units he's sending. Uh, et cetera, along with some, some other details of the plan, but it really needed to be a joint commitment of both the city and the state to bring additional resources at critical times to make sure that we have the, uh, the manpower on the streets that uh, you know, we feel is necessary to deter violence. And, <clears throat> excuse me, in understanding that, I'm, and, and I mean, I, and I hear what you're saying, and, and I think we as city councilors um, stand behind you and with the interim chief to whatever we have to do to make the city safe, we, we have to do what has to be done. No doubt about it. Um, we can all stand here and say, and, and you know as well how many days into the office now, it, it, it takes a, a lot to try to clear a situation up that, that's, in my eyes, is always going to be somewhat of a problem, no matter who sits in your corner office. I, you know, that's the way I look at it. I mean, no matter how we look at it, and it drives us to have to spend some extra, extra money like this. And I, I personally do not have a problem with it because I want to make sure that my neighborhood, my ward, as well right. as the city of Brockton is safe. Right. I guess my, my question back to you would be that if we're spending this type of money with, with overtime um, and because of extra police patrols, uh, which is manpower, I guess I'm, I'm just going to ask you, um, just with a little leniency, if I could, Mr. Mr. Chairman, that, um, and we may see it in the upcoming budget, but I would hope uh, that we're thinking ahead to some type of um, a hiring process so that we're going to have a police academy at some time soon, because I think we undoubtedly, we all know we need, these, we need extra boots on the streets no matter what, and, and we can't keep paying the overtime, or we're just going to be, we're going to be driving uh, ourselves, and, and we're going to be using every, every piece of surplus money that the police department has just to, to do what has to be done. And I don't think we want to do that, but sure. maybe you can give me that answer or I no, can wait to the budget. I'll, I'll be know. happy to respond to that, Councillor. Um, my mindset two weeks ago when we had the 175 request for the fire department, and I only sent up at the time 75 for police, my mindset at the time was to be fiscally conservative in light of the times that we're in and I was trying to hold that $95,000 for between now and the end of the fiscal year. Uh, we certainly have other needs in the city besides just this. Um, but then in light of the events of the past 10 or 12 days, whatever it's been now, um, and based upon the meetings I've had with the various public safety personnel, it became apparent to me that it was critical uh, to the safety of the residents of the city that we respond to this violence in a visible, effective manner in a partnership with the other state agencies, particularly the, the state police. And that's why I this morning submitted the request for the additional 95, which will be heard in front of the next FinCom, and at which time I will make sure Chief Hayden is here to speak to you in detail as to exactly how he plans to deploy that that money, what resources he'll deploy with that money. Okay, but an insight to my question though, you are looking at- Oh, hiring, at yeah. We've had, um, there's been active conversations going on and research. The frustration is that the academies just don't come up uh, right. often enough. Mm -hmm. So I know that they are, I, I believe the next academy is tentatively in July. Okay. And uh, we'll be able to address that in the budget. Okay. But okay. my goal would be so to. It, it yeah. is something you are going to be addressing for Ab next fiscal absolutely, year. Okay. Absolutely, Councillor. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Thank, thank you, Mr. You, Chairman. Councillor Rodriguez. Um, Mr. Chairman, I, 
my question was exactly the question that uh, Councilor from Ward 3 was asking, uh, and I wanted to ask that of the mayor, and I was going to ask you for a little lee uh, leeway as well to ask that specific question because not a day goes by, and, I, and, I, and I'm saying this from the bottom of my heart, the men, the men and women in the uh, Brockton PD are doing a wonderful job with the resources that they have and with, the, with, with what they have. But not a day goes by that they somebody within the PD, in the, within the Brockton Police Department doesn't say that, you know what, we're a little shorthanded, you know, we could use a few more guys, girls, uh, people. Uh, so I wanted to, uh, to, to touch on that as well too because it seems that there are other police departments in the state spending as much money as we are in police but yet have a lot more resources, human resources, police officers in the streets. So my question was going to be basically ba the same question that he asked, uh, Council uh, from War 3 asked, in terms of, you know, it's okay to spend money to fight the issues that you have at hand. I mean, we do have a situation where you've had three murders in the last two weeks, and we understand that. But going forward in the sense, uh, we can't tax the men and women in the police department any more than they're being taxed in terms of putting in the time and effort. So the city of this size, uh, it seems that we're going backwards in terms of the number of police officers in the streets. So you kind of answered in the sense yeah, no, that you said happy. you're going to look, you're going to address that in the budget. But are you, what specifically uh, are either you or the chief of police basically looking at in terms of uh, increase in um, and resources, and I mean financial resources through grants or some of the other programs that exist right. to expand the, uh, you know, the uh, the resources in the uh, police department that we right. have right now. So uh, that planning is ongoing. Uh, I think really, council, what you're talking about is short-term planning and long-term planning. And uh, if there were a July academy, those offices would hit the street in January. If the academy is not held until the fall, those offices wouldn't hit the street until next spring. So um, I, I'm worried about today, next week, next month, right now, in terms of this money mm -hmm. that I'm requesting authorization to transfer. To your point, I agree with you. Uh, I, we do need to do long-term planning. Uh, we are right now looking at the potential of funding a couple of additional police officers with a COPS grant. It does come with strings attached, and you have to commit to staffing levels about four or five years down the road. Um, and I, my early feeling on that is I'm comfortable with it because I plan to be increasing the staffing. Um, in light of what the budget shows us when we get there, I would like to be able to fund a net gain of five officers a year as a long-term plan. I think that's possible and fiscally responsible. Now in this budget, maybe it turns out to be three or four and not five. This is going to be a very tough budget, but uh, I'm committed to a uh, net gain in the police force each year so that over the course of a number of years we can get the uh, the police department more properly staffed we had this conversation just this afternoon with the with the district attorney and the state police the formula that that they quote uh, based upon population is uh, 2.4 per thousand uh, of population which means according to that formula we we'll call for Brockton to have about 240 police officers. We have about 175. So um, I, I am convinced that we are understaffed. Financially, we can't go out and hire 20, uh, but I think that we should just like, almost like a capital plan, we should have a long-term plan for sustained growth uh, of the police department so that over the course of a number of years, we will achieve higher staffing levels. So, so do you... Um foresee um, submitting at budget time an increase in personnel so that yes by, by what by five as you're saying or the, at the least goal right the goal right now is five we've got a lot of work to do over the next 30 days it might turn out to be three or four but is but this I, a, a, a net gain or a net gain not a replacement to some no of the because that's calls. what we've been doing for a number of years counselors so you know, it's easy to say, hey, we've got, you know, 10 officers at the academy, uh, but if due to retirements and, and disabilities, we've got 11 openings where we're not gaining anything. And so I think it does require some advanced planning because of the timing of academies. There are limited opportunities to get officers into the academy. 
Um, and I can tell you that in that hiring council to address your question of the treasurer earlier, uh, we will be uh, very conscious and very proactive in uh, increasing the diversity of the police force. Uh, I am committed to it in all of our hiring practices. I will tell you the last two or three job ads that I've approved, we haven't done very much hiring since I've been here, uh, but we've posted for a school police officer, we've posted for a code enforcement officer, and I've had language added that says, um, uh, can't remember it word for word, but it says um, ability to speak a second language preferred. So I've been told we can't make it an absolute requirement, but we can give a preference to a candidate that possesses that skill if it's stated clearly in the ad. So particularly any city position uh, that would involve dealing with the public, um, I think that uh, that is a critical skill if we can find um, highly qualified people who also possess that extra skill of being able to speak a second language. And that's multiple languages here in this city. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. If there are any, if there aren't any There's more questions. There's a follow-up with Councilor Bonds. Council. Sure. Yes, please. Um, when the additional resources came into the city, the state police and all the, the other guys, DEA and all of those things that were coming with Chief Hayden, um, as I understood it, they were coming in order to kind of neutralize the situation that we had at the time. And they were coming to, in, in support of Chief Hayden and, and respect for him and to help him as he transitioned to the chief of this city. And they are, and they're here every day. Okay. So all of this additional money that's been requested for the police officers and with the 75 and the 95. Right, the total, the total request is 170,000 okay. um, for police overtime, 5,000 less than we just approved for the fire department. Okay, is it for the Brockton police that's or is all, it for is it, all of these other no, additional no. resources? Because, let, let me just finish. Because somebody has to pay those guys too and I, how is that coming? I, I, I don't know if, right. if that is to pay for, um, you know, like I said, like the, the state police, you know, these meetings that you're having with the, the right. DA and all of these other additional time uh, pieces that these other guys are using and our guys and gals that are using. Who is this money going to? So to be very clear, this money is exclusively for Brockton police officers. We do not pay anything towards the other agencies that are here in the city. Okay. As a matter of fact, we're, we're trying to work with a couple of the federal agencies to find some additional police overtime money there. We're talking with Homeland Security investigations right now about the possibility of them doing some joint investigations with Brockton detectives where they would actually be able to deliver some federal dollars um, for Brockton detectives overtime, but that doesn't happen overnight. And I'm concerned about this spring and this summer, the weather's warming up. Um, we've had some violence over the past week and a half, and I want us equipped to, uh, to protect the residents of the city. Okay, thank you. Okay. Council, I entertain a motion. Actually, on, on the, before Council that, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Carpenter, I, I'm supportive of this. Um, I would be interested in, of that 2.4 officers per thousand, uh, that's all officers in the force, or is that yeah. just, okay? All, and I believe that's the Department of Justice guideline that he right. was quoting. I think I remember reading that several years ago, yeah. something similar. I'd be interested, getting from your office, the ratio of patrolmen and um, whatever that other category of officers are, yeah. the, the police brass. You, give, or, give or take a couple. Um, I believe the brass is about 36 and the patrolmen are about 140. And is that the right, I'm curious if that's an appropriate ratio. It's probably a better question for the chief when I bring him in next time. And I'd like to, as part of that question, uh, so that he can prepare, I'd like to know what that ratio should look like with the numbers that yeah. we have. I have a sense that maybe we're uh, overburdened at the top end of, of the officers, which isn't helping the city as much as I think we want it to. So I'm interested in the numbers and also what the payroll looks like. How much are we yeah. spending on the parole, pro, the patrolman level as well as in the top brass level. I, I believe the number of superior offices is controlled by the city council by ordinance. I'm curious what that number looks like. Yeah, I'll, I'll be happy to have the chief prepared to discuss that with you at the next FinCon meeting. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Entertain a motion. Move motion. to approve. Second. A motion was Mr. made, Chairman, public second, a favorable recommendation. Just, just on the motion, just, just one point I just want to make because I just want, want to make sure that everybody has a clear understanding, especially those that are listening at home because I think uh, Councilor Barnes brought up a, a good point. There's a lot of people that don't realize just how 
this is all working out with other agencies helping within the city of Brockton. But if they're here from the state, the state pays them. If they're here from the county, the Plymouth County Sheriff's Department, the sheriff's paying them. If it's federal, federal's paying them. We're not paying any extra agency costs. This is pertaining to our men and our men only, correct? Th uh, that's correct, Counselor. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Motion made, properly seconded. It's a favorable recommendation of this order back to the full city council. All in favor, raise your hand. All opposed, motion carries. Thank, Thank you, you Counselors. Madam Clerk, number 12. Order appropriation of $228,510.50 from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts Executive Office of Health and Human Services Safe and Successful Youth Initiative Grant to the Office of the Mayor Safe and Successful Youth Initiative Grant Fund. These grant funds will be used for programming at 90 Main Street, GED classes, subsidized job placements, case management, outreach services, faith-based home visits, and therapy at the Plymouth County House of Corrections. Invited Honorable Mayor Bill Carpenter, John A. Condon, Chief Financial Officer. Mr. Condon. Evening, Counselors. Uh, this is a grant that's administered out of the Mayor's office. It's a continuing grant. This particular amounts for $228,000. There is no match. It's mainly uh, exercised through uh, partners with the city, the YMCA, United Way. Um, <clears throat> the um, programs are mainly for young folks, some of whom are incarcerated. In some cases, you're helping them get GED. Uh, classes and subsidized job placements, but the intent is to help direct uh, younger people in the city who might be at risk uh, to a better outcome with their lives. Motion to approve. On Second. The, on the motion. That's cool on the motion. Uh, just a question. This is something we've had for many years, but I don't recall seeing therapy at the House of Corrections. Is that aimed at people, uh, Brockton residents who are in the House of Corrections, or? I believe these are supposed to be Brockton residents, Councilor. I'd have to check uh, in the in the grant documents themselves. To it, it strikes me as that that last line is is totally new from this uh, this grant in the past, and it, it just strikes me as that that wouldn't be something we'd be. Uh, uh, so, uh, Mr. Mayor, is the person who's is the person who's doing this will be going down to the House of Corrections? And right, my. Uh, my uh, explanation, the understanding I got of it is it's targeted towards uh, pre-release offender re-entry services while the person is still incarcerated at the House of Correction. It is specific to Brockton residents, folks that are anticipating returning to the community in the city of Brockton, and it's I think it's within three months or six months in the, in the relatively near future. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Motion made, properly seconded. Uh, favorable recommendation of agenda item number 12 back to the full city council. All in favor? All opposed? Motion carries. Madam Clerk, number 13, please. Order appropriation of $38,691 from the parking meter reserves fee, $30,000, and from parking authority part time services, $8,691 to the parking authority snow removal in order to cover the shortfall in fiscal year 2014 plowing, sanding, and removal of snow from the parking authority. Invited Honorable Mayor Bill Carpenter, John A. Conn, Chief Financial Officer, and Robert Malley, Executive Director, Parking Authority. Mr. Malley, good evening. Move to approve. Second. Motion made, properly second, a favorable recommendation on the motion, Council Dubois. Oh, no, 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 no. Not okay. on the motion, you remove that. Uh, favorable no. recommendation on uh, Council Rodriguez on the motion. I do have a question, um, and Mr. Chairman, I do ask for a little leeway here just to ask something that I, that escaped me the last time that you were here, Mr. Malley. Uh, the last time you were here, you're looking for some funding to pay for some rent or lease, lease, lease parking lots, yes. In a couple parking lots that you lease from individuals here in the city. Yes, that's yes. Who cleans the snow on those parking lots? We do, it's part of the lease. It's part of the lease? Yeah. And how many of these uh, parking lots do we have that we lease? Uh, one, two, three, four, there's four of them. Uh, you have the Stadelman lot up here, which is on a long term. I think that's, uh, we're getting towards the end of a 15-year lease there with a five-year uh, extension. And then we have the D'Angelo's property on uh, Montello Street. Um, the, uh, the one behind uh, the car dealership across the street from that uh, on Petronelli Way. And uh, most recently, um, the cable access lower parking lot. Those four. Uh, in your in your opinion, are we getting the biggest bang for our, our leasing dollars on these parking lots? Uh, actually, 
my preference would be to build more facilities. We, we desperately need another garage. Um, but I mean, the money that we're spending on these, on these lots, Mr. Chairman, are we getting our return? Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, because we're leasing out every space. And we're not losing money on them. It, they, the, the, the most recent um, leases uh, were to make room for the people who were displaced by the Trinity Financial Project. Right? We lost 120 spaces there. Plus, there was another lot. Um, uh, it's next to the park, the Korean Veterans Park up there. Uh, that wasn't ours, but all those people needed to be accommodated also. Uh, and so, um, because the people work at downtown businesses, the uh, Neighborhood Health Center, WB Masons, uh, we needed to provide parking as close as possible to those places. So we grabbed everything that we could in the vicinity. Uh, Mr. Chairman, if you allow me just uh, to, to get off the subject for one microsecond here, just ask something else that popped into the old head here. Um, you're in charge of the uh, the meter folks. Yes. Um, and I brought this up with uh, Councillor Studensky uh, not too long ago, but uh, I had again uh, a resident in the uh, in the uh, in that area that called me this morning to say that there's a great number of people, commuters, commuters going into Boston, parking their cars on Stillman Ave. Stillman Ave. The uh, by Crescent Court. Plymouth Street, across the East street, Side. Across the street from the, the Plough School. Housing Development. Past Commercial Street, right? Across the street from Plough School. Yeah, that's outside the perimeter of where my guys patrol. We go as far as Commercial Street, right, going east. We're in the Central Business District. <laughs> so that falls under the uh, police, police department. department? Yeah. Uh, Mr. Mayor, can I just, Mr. Chairman, can I? Absolutely, Council. So I'm parking enforcement now, huh? Hey, why not? <laughs> you know, listen, we all wear a whole bunch of hats. Um, again, the, question, the same question goes to you. I mean, if these individuals who are supposed to be using the lots, the appropriate lots, and paying what they're supposed to be paying on those lots are now parking in areas that residents should be parking, is there any way we can get, I mean, we're looking at yeah. I'm, I'm sure resources. we can direct the complaint. Yeah, give me this, if you do just text me or email me the specifics, counselor, I'll refer it over to the police department, ask them to send someone out there and do some enforcement. Yeah, because uh, somebody actually had said to me that it's interesting around the 7.30, 8 o'clock hour in the sense, you see all these cars just being parked all over the place and then people walking away from them and those cars just sit there all afternoon long and then around 4 or 5 o'clock, those cars disappear, so. Yep, if you could send me the specific location, I'll be happy to forward along and ask for some enforcement in that area. I will. Absolutely. Mr. Chairman, point of information Council. through you. Um, Councillor Rodriguez, I had that issue down by uh, the Montello T station in Ward 6, and my solution was I went before the parking authority, and we made that section of road uh, resident-only parking for certain hours of the day, and that was extremely effective, so you might want to look into that as well. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. I, th I think that might be Traffic Commission to get that done. Yeah. Did I say, I, I, meant to, I meant to say Traffic Commission. Thank yeah, you very much. Yeah, interestingly enough, I think I sit on traffic, so it might be a little. <laughs> <laughs> well, then I'll forward the email to you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Mr. Chairman, if there's no more. Yeah, I have. And it, there's no uh, reason that we can't, uh, we, we've never had a complaint from Stillman App because it's not part of ours, but. It's not just, still, that's it's not still just Stillman. It's Stillman and Center. The, coming towards, coming towards um, Commercial Street. Right, yeah, w there's no reason we can't expand a little bit outside there. I mean, there's nothing in the law that says we can't go outside there. That just wasn't the way it was set up. And this being the first time I've heard this. No, it's been a, it's been a serious issue, uh, both for residents in that area yeah. and residents outside of the area complaining about, you know, individuals utilizing that area for, and I've told them, I had a conversation with, uh, with the former chief and from Ward 4, and um, we basically thought it was all the, the welfare. You had said to me that through the chair that it were the folks working at the welfare office or something like that that were parking their cars there, and I said that to the, the individual that had filed a complaint to me, and they basically said, no, we can show you pictures that I've taken of people with their backpacks walking towards the, uh, the train stations, not going to offices around that area so we it ought to be something we look, look into look uh, mr chairman if there aren't any more questions two more councils that want to 
Oh, they are? Okay. Yeah, uh, Consulate Dinapoli followed oh. by Consulate Bonds. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chairman. Th 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 thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, through the Chair, uh, Councilor Rodriguez, uh, first of all, I haven't received one phone call on what you're discussing here in Center in Stillman. And I sat on traffic, and I have been for the past uh, 10 years. You sit on it now. Uh, we don't have any restrictions on residential parking. Uh, the streets are open to almost anybody. I know if, if there is a problem where they're taking the train in town, we can address it. And I just wanted to bring that forward. Thank you, Councilor. Councilor Bonds. Yes, uh, Mr. Malley, just one thing. Uh, the four additional lots, you mentioned the one, the old D'Angelo on Montello. Yes. Okay. And that is, that, that's a lot that the city is leasing to have people park there and yes. paying. Okay, what's going to happen when, and if I'm correct, through the chair actually to uh, Councilor Dubois, at the meeting, the License Commission meeting, wasn't there someone that, was, that came through there that she's going to have a restaurant there? Was it that location? Did you hear that? I don't know. I don't, okay. think, I don't believe so. Councilor. Okay, I, I could swear the that there's I, a restaurant the last thing going I heard in there. For that was uh, some kind of a uh, housing. At the D'Angelo, in between the Dunkin' Donuts yes. and uh, the, the car dealership. Yeah. I think there's a soul food restaurant going there. If I remember correctly, the woman that was at the, uh, actually through the chair to Mr. DiNapoli, is that true? Through the chair, Councillor. Uh, that, that property right now is, uh, is under, uh, under uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Under, under agreement? agreement? Option okay. to and buy. Option not, to buy. Not, not the, not the D'Angelo's. No. No, the D'Angelo's is going to be 48 units of housing. Okay, maybe, maybe I have my geography wrong, but I just wanted to kind of find out if that were to happen, what's to happen to those, air, those spaces for the city? Um, if we're, we'll have to find more. We're renting it, yeah, okay. <laughs> okay. All right, thank you, sir. Thank you, Council. Mr. Council, there's been a motion. Mr. Chairman, on the motion. Uh, <laughs> just just to, uh, maybe, I'm not sure if this is a point of information, but I, you know, unless um, residents are, uh, in, inflicted by commuters who are leaving Brockton to go to work, parking on um, you know, open streets. I don't know if we want to be in the business of trying to you know, tax or f place a fee on people who are struggling every day to make ends meet to go to work, unless, of course, it's impacting a neighborhood negatively. So I just want to make certain that Councilor, I think, I think Councilor Rodriguez was saying he's gotten complaints that it is impacting. Let's I, move on. This has been this is yeah. off track. We're Let's move on. There's a motion right. made. It's been properly seconded. Favorable recommendation. Back to the full city council. All in favor, raise your hands. All opposed. That motion carries. Thank Number you. Number 14, please. Order that the DPW is authorized to issue one single family home sewer connection for plot two Edgar Street owned by Ms. Steve Torrey. Invited Michael Thorson, Commissioner of DPW, Larry Rowley, Superintendent of Utilities, DPW, Steve Torrey, resident. Council Dubois. Anne Marie, I'm sorry for speaking <laughs> over you. I apologize. Um, I, I, I just. I conferred with the building inspector superintendent and um, this lot may not be buildable so at this time I'd like to table this. Move to table. Second. Motion is made properly second to table. All in favor please raise your hand. All opposed that's tabled. Number 15 please. Resolved that the mayor, the library director, the chairman of the board of library trustees, the superintendent of buildings, and the chairman of the library foundation be invited to appear before a committee of this council to provide information on planned improvements to the West Branch Library. Invited Honorable Mayor Bill Carpenter, Elizabeth Marcus, library director, James Cassiri, superintendent of buildings, Elliot Miller, chairman, board of trustees, and Frederick Howell, president, library foundation. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Oh, Councilor, this is your resolve. Councilor Yanari, Ward thank, 3. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And for those councilors that were here last year, um, this was an issue that we had talked about. I had brought uh, uh, the same, pretty much the same people before us in regards to the West Side Library. And for those of you that are new, um, at the end of the year, I think it was uh, somewhere around, if I'm not mistaken, somewhere around August, September, could be October, I believe the, the Library Foundation uh, had uh, come forth and indicated that they were going to give a gift to the city of Brockton, I believe for the sum of $50,000 to start to do some renovation works to the West Side Library. Um, just quick history, the West Side Library for the last eight or nine years um, has needed some well, uh, well uh, un un unneeded uh, renovations because uh, it seems like we've been given it a little bit of, uh, of uh, neglect and at this point in time with the foundation coming forth and making that uh, amount of money, I believe through the building department, I believe that's where the money went towards us for 
the building superintendent to be able to come up with working with the um, library director and foundation to what uh, renovations would um, would be done to the uh, to the branch library so I filed it again because I'm, I'm very curious and interested to see just when we're going to start to do some work um, on the building um, because of its as I call it neglect and I even went by there drove by today and I look at it and and, and it's sad to say that it's a, a branch library that sits there um, not utilized not utilized at all is the way I look at it as much as it's utilized for nine hours a week but in any any case I do want to hear from the building superintendent and those that are trying to work on getting some renovations done um, and, and the mayor being new to to this particular um, uh, situation as well but at the end I, I do want to hear just briefly how we're going to start to <clears throat> utilize the building because the building uh, again has not been utilized the correct way nine hours a week just doesn't just doesn't cut it for me to be truthful with you and if we're not going to be able to use it, utilize it the way that it should be utilized as a library then we need to start to take a look at it as a city building to what we need to do with it or how we're going to handle it or, or sell it at some <laughs> point in time I mean I hate to use that term but um, we need to be doing something with it than just to let it sit there um, and just quick um, I know the East Side Library branch had renovations some uh, eight or nine years ago and this one got for whatever reason left left behind so that's the reason for me filing it and uh, I'll turn it over to the building superintendent at this point mr. chairman to thank um, you counselor thank you mr. superintendent good evening how are you um, thank you yeah that's what you said is correct counselor we received fifty thousand dollars from the library foundation and there's multiple things that need to be done there I mean if you were really going to rehab the building you need a new roof gutters windows you need a new ac system a new boiler you need to pretty much do the whole inside get rid of the carpets paint the walls i mean you could spend hundreds of thousands of dollars there um for a library that's open nine hours a week it's maybe a time for some serious conversations about that i know that the main library needs a lot of work too so if, if, if this were a business and I were running it, I'd be spending it at the main library. However, right now, um, we're going, we have the designs done for a roof and gutters. That's, we figured that would be the first best place to start. And uh, that's going out to bid in the Central Register in the Brockton Enterprise on April 23rd. Uh, the drawings and specifications will be available at the procurement office on that day. And then uh, the bids... The walkthrough will be on April 30th. At that time, the, the bid will be awarded and we'll put a new roof and gutters on the building, probably starting in May, I would say. The reason I didn't rush it, the building wasn't leaking and I don't like to do roof repairs during mm -hmm. the winter. Okay, so, so, so that's gonna be the beginning part of, of what we're gonna be using probably $50,000 for is, is, is the roof and the gutters, I would say, pretty much, right? I don't know how much that will eat up. We're gonna find out when the bids come in. I don't but think it's it will gonna eat up pretty much, but, you know, but it'll eat up a good piece of it and leave us with a little something maybe to, yeah. to, do, to do something else, whether it be to, to do, are the windows, the windows need to be? The windows need to be done. But I mean, at some point, I think the conversation should be had before we spend all this money on that building if it's, if it's just throwing money out the window. I mean, we use the, I know that no one wants to hear that, but I'm not a politician. We have four libraries at the high school and we have one at West Junior High right there. Right, right. It's only open six hours a week that the children would be able to use it because three out of the hours are on Monday from nine to 12. So we're talking six hours and it just, for me, it seems, and I, Jay and I have had the conversation before, and I don't want to speak for Jay, and I know he can speak for himself, but it's time to have some conversations about this building, in my opinion. Yeah, and, and I do not disagree with you, and I would hope that um, the mayor will probably have that conversation with um, the library board of trustees, as well as the foundation, as he's going through the budget process to what do we do because um, you know first to put a you know the roof and the gutters and all the other things that need to be done I, I mean and then only you, what are we going to do open it up for another hour so we're using it 10 hours a week it just does not seem fruitful to and me if, either um, and if you decide to sell it you're going to put 300,000 into it and sell it for 200,000 I mean I mean stuff I mean the, something to think about right in, in the day of having uh, I know the neighborhood uh, libraries like you had some years ago you had the Montello you had the Campello you had the east side the way I mean it's not like it was back then and, and uh, probably the the biggest historical 
uh, venture of having this library where it is is because the Little Red Schoolhouse sat there so many, many years ago. And, you know, that's that piece of property. But um, in any case, I, I can't disagree with you on that. And I think we need to, we need to take a hard look at it. I, I think both branches, uh, the trustees and the foundation, need to come together and, and decide just what we're going to, to do. Um, um, or we're going to let a building just sit there and continue and, to decay. And I, and I know it that. seems neglected, but I've spent about 10000 on that building this year. And... I'm responsible for 70 buildings, and the ones that I pay the most attention to are the ones that are used 24 hours a day, seven days a week, like the police station and the fire station. Fire station, you have apparatus, you, but it's, you're actually housing firemen. Right. So this is not a priority for me. Um, I'm willing to do whatever I'm directed to do. Um, but having said that, I think Correct. you can kind of get how and, I and, and I appreciate that and, and I know mr. chairman there are other you know people here as well as the library director and uh, uh, the chairman of the board of uh, trustees as well as the uh, library foundation so if they want to you know chime in I, I welcome that um, absolutely Council. the mayor as well if he has something to can I say one more thing yes sir. right now I'm spending uh, ninety eight hundred dollars on the main library doing a temporary roof repair there uh, I say temporary because that's the only way I can put it that building could use a new roof at some point, probably not this year, maybe not next year, but that's on the, uh, the, the, main, pool, library, the main library, the main library, historic the main library. Okay. That's where we should be putting our resources, mm -hmm. in my opinion. Okay. So. I thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Kasiri, uh, Mr. Chairman. I don't know if anyone else wants to chime in or not, but yeah, uh, I actually have Council Dubois followed by Council Bonds. You know. Thank you. Thank you, um, Council. I'm wondering if um, Mr. Miller and Mr. Howell would come to the. To the speaker podium. Thank you so much. I'm going to ask the same questions of both of you. Um, what do you think, uh, Mr. Miller, of the idea of potentially closing the West Library? Uh, I wouldn't be for it. We do have residents who still use it in that area. Um, Everything is, in t is a uh, budget concern. We could keep it open 40 hours a week, but our budget doesn't allow us to do that. Uh, it is used. It can be used more. And, and as, your, as uh, Councilor Ianeri was saying, that it's not you or used by the students. Actually, a lot of the students from the high school do come and use that library because it is uh, convenient from the high school. So we do use that library. I think it is worth saving. Uh, I understand uh, the budget constraints, uh, but I would like to try to save that and use it. Uh, I know we've discussed um, in our uh, Board of Trustees meeting of how to use it for more hours. Um, the, the thing we have is we have to keep each library open so many hours. Uh, our main library is the main library. Uh, but I think it would be a shame to close a, 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 another library uh, in our city uh, of the size that we have. Thank you, Mr. Miller. Thank you. Mr. Howell? I'm going to ask her, oh, you know what? I will, I will say that because I have questions for her anyways. Um, library Director Marcus. So I'm going to ask you different questions. Sure. All right. Evening. So. Um, if this library were to close, because as I understand it, there have to be so many hours that a li libraries in the city are open for us to be able to retain funding um, from different sources. Mm -hmm. Does this nine hours play a pivotal role in us getting to those hours of the library being open? Right now they do. Currently we're open 60 unduplicated hours across the three library buildings. In order to be fully funded for our state aid to public libraries program, we have to be open 63 unduplicated hours. So the reason why West Branch is open um, from 9 to 12 on Monday mornings and East Branch is open on Tuesday mornings from 9 to 12 is um, to give some unduplicated hours to that branch. And then the main library opens at noon. So that way the main library is open two nights, each branch is open one night. So that's how we've done it. When I first came um, to the city as library director, we were only open 50 unduplicated hours a week. And in my first year, I was able to add 10 additional hours to our public library services. 
8 at, public li at the main library by opening Fridays from 9 to 5, and then one additional hour each at West and East. We were opening at 3 o'clock on Wednesday and Thursday afternoons, and now we're open at 2. So as Mr. Miller pointed out, we do get more high school students in and more middle school students into East Branch on the Thursdays that we're open. It is a small, um, a small victory. <laughs> But it's That's a victory. great. So did I hear you correctly that we're supposed to have 63 unduplicated hours and we have 60? We have 60, and because of that, we get a slightly reduced um, or discounted state aid to public libraries award. Discounted. If we were to be open um, the three extra hours, we'd probably get somewhere around $12,000 more a year. And I do have a proposal out to open the branches more hours so that we can reach the 63 hours a week. And um, I, I figured sort of loosely that one branch open on a Sunday afternoon would cost Ooh. about $25,000. In exchange for that, we'd meet our full state aid and we get approximately twelve dollars to $15,000 more a year. So in effect, it will really only cost us about $10,000 more to open up one branch on a Sunday afternoon. I would love that. I would so love would that. I. Can you <laughs> tell me um, how many hours does the West Branch provide for unduplicated time? Nine hours. They each provide nine hours. So it provides the nine hours it's open for unduplicated time? Correct. Okay. And when was the last time the West Branch was open more than nine hours? Was that before you? It was well before my time, yes. Okay. And what are the hours at the West Branch? They're open Monday mornings from 9 to 12, and then Wednesdays from 2 to 8. And then East Branch is open Tuesday mornings from 9 to 12, and Thursdays from 2 to 8. Thank you. Um, let me Welcome. see, make sure I ask all my questions. How would you feel about the, the, what, the West Side Library closing? And what would be the ramifications on the, on the user, the user, the end user of the library? We have a great number of people, from the, especially from the west side of the city, who enjoy going to West Branch. We have a large group of uh, older population that has some difficulty getting into the main library. A lot of fiction readers, so we're very heavily um, um, stocked with fiction, new fiction. So I think that would be a loss to some of the residents um, on the west side of the city. Um, I, I w also would not want to see it closed. I, I defer to Mr. Miller on that. I, I think that most of the Board of Trustees uh, would not want to see another branch close. We used to have four branches, as you might remember. It was before my time. We had Campello Branch, Montello, East and West. And those branches were all open many, many more hours. So I'm never in favor of closing a library any hours. Exactly. I'm only in favor of expanding. Now, I was at the, um, like a, a visioning session that occurred at the library. And when I was there, there was a lot of talk about utilizing the West Library for more interactive um, space and actually launching a campaign to create some kind of structure there that would have like visual movies and these other things. I don't know all the details, but is that group yeah. still moving forward with this idea? Do, have you, do you remember that idea in better detail than I do? That idea was to um, create a music center and the trustees uh, about a year ago decided that that really did not follow the scope of what we could do with the resources that we have, that we really need to make sure that we're covering our bread and butter services such as circulation, you know, um, interlibrary loan, the, the computer and internet services that we provide, children's services and programs, and that went um, a bit outside of what we thought we could sustain with the resources we have. Sounds good. Could you provide uh, the City Council circulation data from um, all the branches, the main branch, west and east, for some period of time that's um, most convenient for you, be it the 12-month period? That might be a better reflection. If you have a report that you already have to produce, could you produce sure. that for us so we can get an idea of how, how much use these branch libraries are getting? Sure. Every year I do what's called an ARIS report. It's an annual report that I have to send into the state in order to qualify for state aid. And if I'm recalling my numbers, West Branch had approximately 
approximately 15,000 items circulated <clears throat> and West Branch about 17, and excuse me, East Branch had a little bit more than West, 17,000 versus 15,000. West Branch had gone down in circulation a little bit in, in, the the pri in this past year. And the main library had, um, two, uh, I'm guessing, I think around 250,000, but I'd have to look it up. But I'm very happy to provide you with those, um, with those numbers. They look back at the prior year, and then every August I, I do another report. I remember the bookmobile. <laughs> That's how far back I go. Mm -hmm. And I well, remember we... seeing my grandfather walking through the high school delivering books through interlibrary loan when he volunteered and worked up there. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm a big supporter of the library, and I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, if, if, if I might, I'd just like to make a, a, a point before we hear from the next, uh, the next uh, person, I believe the president of the Library Foundation, but I just want everybody to, to understand that when we were having the discussion, it was basically A, talking about the building and its renovations, B, we were discussing if it was going to be, um, if it was going to be utilized the, the correct way, maybe the thought would be of maybe possibly, you know, looking to close it, but no one's actually said we're closing the building, and I want that perfectly understood. And, and it's in my ward, and I represent that section of the city, and the one thing I don't want to see is the library closed because it's in, as I said, a historic site to what used to be sitting on that piece of property some many, many years ago uh, when probably some of these were still just in diapers. But in any case, I want it understood that nobody said the library is closing. And, and I would hope that, and it sounds like, uh, that the library director has come up with some type of a plan that, you know, maybe we're going to be able to utilize both the west side and the east side library a little bit more so than what we're doing now. And, and that's, that's what I want understood in the same token, as the building superintendent said, we need to do other work there, and that's something that the mayor has to work with you people when you're preparing your budget, and even with the building department, of where can we come up with some funding? Can we come up with some other grant monies? What can we do? to save the situation and, and put this building on track and even bringing it up to the standards of today and having every piece of technology that could be there. I mean, that would be wonderful. It would be great for those students that are in that area. So I just wanted to clarify that, Mr. Chairman. Thank, Thank you. you. Carson Dubois, you still have the floor. Thank you so much. And, oh, no, I appreciate that clarification, and I see that the actual resolve before us says be invited to appear before the committee of this council to provide information on planned improvements not the closure. So I just, I'm just asking those questions, but I do understand that this, um, we're talking about improvements. Um, do you know about the like planned improvements or would that be someone else's? Um... Well, Mr. Kassiri is the manager of, the, of right. that program, so I would uh, defer to him, but I do know that we have a bid in progress. We have a walkthrough coming up next week. Yes, he did. And talk then we'll about be that. able to um, get bids. And we have contracted with an architect to provide all the specifications so that we could go out to bid for it. So I know he's uh, he's he's doing a very good job trying to get that to move forward. And it was a very long, difficult winter. I know he would have done it earlier if we hadn't had such a really bad winter. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Howell. Um, am I pronouncing your name correctly? Yes. Come on up. Thank you, um, thank you I, for having me. Thank you're, uh, we're happy that you're here, and thank you for your volunteerism. I really appreciate it, and all the money that you've raised uh, for the libraries, you and your team, and everybody in Brockton that's donated. So thank you very much. Thank you. Um, from your perspective, um, what are your thoughts about the discussion this evening? Well, I think it would be a t tremendous loss to the city and to the community if you, if you even thought about shutting that branch down. I, I beg you to try to find some ways to find some additional funding to the library so that they can open it up for more hours, uh, particularly for the students in the, in the high school. If you could find your way free of maybe opening up a, a few thousand dollars, you could open up that branch during the evening hours when student in the afternoon and evening when they could actually utilize it. Uh, we've been proposing renovating that building now for over two years, and we are hopeful that we can get that done. Uh, we proposed to do the windows, the roof, and the handicap ramp two years ago, uh, and we've been waiting ever since. Uh, so whatever we can do to support you, we'd appreciate that. We've already spent hundreds of thousands of dollars renovating a building that was renovated, which was very frustrating for us because there were many issues with that building, particularly the heating and air conditioning Which system. Which building are we talking about? The main, the main okay. branch. Yep. Uh, 
and to hear that the roof is leaking now is, is uh, exasperating. Yes, because how long ago was that um, renovation? That wasn't, didn't seem to be that long ago. 2003. I mean, I'm, my roof is still at 1960. I mean, it's got to be replaced, but yes. <laughs> I can't even imagine if it was just a few years ago. Well, that's you, frustrating. you know, and again, Mr. Caseri said he spent $10,000 on the West Branch. Uh, that's probably the first 10000 that's been, been spent on that building since 1969 when it was built. Uh, again, whatever we can do to help, we're here. Uh, so we're looking for leadership on the part of the library director, the board of trustees, and the city. How much has your group raised in the past around? Millions of dollars. Millions, because you were a big motivator in raising the money for the, for the um, capital campaign, That's correct? correct. That's now, correct. Now, would your group be willing to raise funds for uh, staffing costs? That's I know a, it's more difficult to raise funds for difficult. staffing we're costs. It's more difficult. We are a 501c3 nonprofit, um, and raising funds for salary and administration is a much more difficult sell. Yeah. Capital projects seem to sell better than salaries. It's just the lay of the land. It's and, very true. And most of the companies and corporations that are available to do, give larger donations are very reluctant to give those towards administrative costs. Might your group be willing to help fundraise for capital improvements? Absolutely. At the we actually have we have money available for capital improvements. Great. Thank you very much. And that's much. why we gave the fifty thousand dollars. Thank you very much. Any other questions? I, I have, I'm uh, done. Uh, Dr. Stewart. Um, if, if it's okay with my colleague. Uh, I, uh, so I'm, I'm a big fan of the library, Mr. Howell. I really appreciate your leadership and the work that you guys have done as a team um, in terms of supporting the library. I, I've said this before, and I also believe the mayor has a, a similar sentiment that if we were to invest more money in our public parks and playgrounds and the library where you find lots of young people hanging out, uh, it's a more cost-effective way to keep the city safe and even designing special programs for youth because the facilities are used um, across constituencies. So have you guys considered um, the idea that uh, a library that has more hours available to young people as a crime deterrent? Well, it's, known, it, it's, it's been done numerous times across the country and it's, it's been proven to be effective, but that would be an initiative for the library director and the board of trustees. Okay, so, so your fundraising strategy couldn't in, could not include using, finding federal monies to support? Oh, sure. If they can find, if they can put together some programs, we'll try to find funding for it. Please, yes. The uh, library director may want to address this after, after I, but we have been discussing and working uh, setting up a, a teen center in the library uh, for after-school programs. Um, and that's something that will be coming soon. We just uh, were discussing it in our last meeting. So we are working on that and are working on grants. Um, I'd, I'd like to turn it over to the library director because she is more familiar with that than I am. Uh, and she can explain that if, if, if you would uh, care to, to hear. Yeah, I would, I would love to get more information on what that strategy looks like. Well, for those of you who have been in the library uh, lately, you'll remember that in the front of the building where the, um, the old part of the building, the Carnegie part, there's a, a beautiful um, room that used to house some periodicals and some foreign language materials. We've been clearing out that room to make way for a teen center, and we're going to be having, um, so we're moving um, our very historic painting, the Buccaneers, um, to a better spot so that the teens won't be able to touch it or impact it at all. We're clearing out the entire space and then we're going to be repainting it, getting new furniture, shelving, and um, new small notebook laptops so that the kids can come in and um, they'll have a signature teen space. They're helping with the decorations, they're choosing the um, uh, the furniture, and uh, we will have art contests and things where they can create murals um, and uh, maybe even have cafe style tables for them to sit at. So it will be a real um, comfortable and an attractive urban environment for them to come in and relax after school. We're still going to have homework help 
in the reference department, so some of the materials will remain up there. But if they just want to come and read a good book, um, a graphic novel, a magazine, we'll also have the video games um, in there and a place for them to meet, get onto the internet. There won't be anyone allow anyone over the age of 18 will not be allowed in the room after 2 o'clock, from 2 o'clock to closing and on Saturdays. It'll be teen zone only. So we're working on that and hopeful that we get that going by um, by the summer. And Ms. Marcos, naming that as a teen center, does, does that allow you to pursue uh, funding opportunities that were not available because it wasn't named as such? That's really my, my question. One thing that we'll be able to get is an LSTA grant for um, something called Teens and Tweens, and that's to serve populations from about age 12 to 18. Without having a person whose job it is really to serve the teens, it's very hard to apply for any type of grants. And in order to have um, enough uh, teens to come into the library to justify it, we wanted to create this space for them. So we're really hoping that one will build on another. It's really exciting, and I do hope that it's going to be available by, um, by the summertime. Thank you. Um, I did want to clarify one point. Is sure. that be okay? About the roof um, and the leak on the roof. And Mr. Kassiri can, is much more expert at this than I am. But I wanted to let you know that it isn't the new roof. Um, the, the library is not new. It's 11 years old, almost 12 years old now. So there's nothing actually new in it. But the new roof is fine. It's a design problem where the old library and the new library roof lines meet. Um, there was supposed to be a kind of rubber roof that was supposed to come up and over that area where the two buildings meet. And instead of coming up and over to keep the rain out, the rubber came up and then stopped. And then a cap, a stone cap or a cement cap was put over the top of it. That cap is eroding. So it's really a design problem that needs to be addressed. Um, it is getting worse over time. Um, but I, I want to assure you that the new library itself, it's not the roof on that. In fact, we had the inspector up, and he said that part of the roof is just fine. It's just where the two meet that um, is causing the problem. So I, I'm not an engineer, but I did want to um, clarify that point. Thank you. I want to thank Councilor Ian Airy uh, for finalist this resolve. Uh, you know, in my, my role as a counselor at large, uh, I support the West Library. I mean, it's an asset to young and old in the city of Brockton. So as long as I'm on the city council, I'll never support closing it. It doesn't make any sense to do that, in my humble opinion. But Dennis, I think it's, uh, it's very valuable to bring all the players at the table. So I want to thank you for what you did thank tonight. Thank you. And just one, just one point. I, I do want to, again, thank the foundation for um, coming forth and, and giving the, uh, the library uh, $50,000 to do the work that's needed there at the West Branch Library. As, uh, as Mr. Howell said, I mean, they, they raise uh, millions of dollars to, to try to do these things, and they're always working uh, the best they can with the uh, Board of Trustees so that they can uh, all work together in a collaborative effort because we're all here for one main goal, and that's to work for the best interest, I think, of the, of the people that uh, use a library, especially our adults and our children as well. So with that being said, I move for a favorable recommendation. Second. Second. Motion made, properly second, a favorable recommendation. Recommendation back to the full city council. All in favor, please raise your hand. All opposed, that motion carries. Madam Clerk, 16, please. Resolved that the city's mayor, chief financial officer, DPW commissioner, and Mr. George Woodbury, representative from Solex Consulting, come before the finance committee to discuss the potential of street lights, conversion to LED lighting, and other technological upgrades associated with operating cost reductions and benefits to the city of Brockton. Invited Honorable Mayor Bill Carpenter, John A. Conn and Chief Financial Officer Michael Thorson, Commissioner DPW, George Woodbury, Executive Vice President, Solux Consulting. Mr. Chairman. Councilor Sullivan. Councilors, I filed this resolve uh, for, for those that were on the City Council um, a few years ago. Uh, Mr. Woodbury may look familiar. Uh, at that time, he came before us to talk about the uh, potential streetlight acquisition in the City of Brockton. And for those uh, newcomers on the City Council. Um, it, it took a long time, but it came to fruition and it saved the City of Brockton a ton, a ton of money. When I mean a ton of money, I'm talking hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars. It's gonna be reoccurring savings. I, I recently saw Mr. Woodbury at another municipality doing a presentation on the LEDs. And uh, you know, during the campaign, I, I, I mentioned I thought it would be extremely important for the City of Brockton to jump on board with this concept. Uh, I know the mayor's here tonight and, and I, he and I have talked about this as well. One of the true benefits, uh, first of all, is that 
the streetlights will have a longer life. It will be a 10-year uh, warranty relative to the streetlights, the actual bulbs. Uh, there's other things, uh, amenities and benefits that Mr. Woodbury again exp is going to explain to us tonight. But one of the other real benefits is that the utility companies right now are giving municipalities uh, grant money to help uh, uh, cut some of the costs, the expense, the upfront expense to, uh, to change out the lights to LED. So with that, uh, I want to thank Mr. Woodbury for being here. Very patient. It was an hour and a half uh, sitting around. But uh, Mr. Woodbury, if you could please, uh, I know you were kind enough to draft up a, a summary sheet that was passed out to all my colleagues. But again, uh, if you could uh, begin your presentation tonight. Uh, thank you very much. It's an honor to be here. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, I was the public works director in the town of Lexington, Massachusetts, um, and was the author of the legislation in the state that allows cities and towns to take over their streetlights. I've now been involved in legislation in Maine, Rhode Island, and also in the state of Maryland, and now in California. So I've been around this business now about 16 years. Um, when we wrote your report a number of years ago about the acquisition of your streetlights, one of the things we identified was the future potential of converting them to LED technology. At that time, you currently have 7,736 street light, uh, 7,736 uh, street lights that cost you somewhere in the neighborhood of 800 to $850,000 a year. Um, I know there's been some new expenses that started last summer because of a, a, a problem uh, that National Grid instituted uh, requiring circuits be de-energized de and they started charging you uh, to de-energize the circuit and then re-energize the circuit. Um, and I'll talk about that in a second. Um, one of the other things that we're facing is, any of you that are tracking the gas markets know that the, the constraint of getting gas into New England is starting to drive prices northward. And we're seeing uh, anywhere up to an eight or 9% increase in energy costs just this year with the bids for going forward. So this is one of the things that we need to be concerned with. In your case, that would amount to about, on the street line alone, $60,000 a year increased cost based on increasing energy cost. Um, the issues with National Grid, one was the energizing and de-energizing of the circuit. This issue was taken on by the Metropolitan Area Planning Council. It also has been a major issue in the negotiations in front of the Public Utility Commission in Rhode Island. National Grid is now backed off of this requirement. They have agreed that as long as the uh, contractor or the employees doing the work meet certain minimum OSHA standards, they will not require this and they will not interfere with the work. So that's a very good piece of news. The second issue was is that they didn't have a tariff that provided for LEDs. Uh, we've been pushing them on this issue and finally last fall, uh, they announced they were going to institute a uh, tariff for LED technology. Um, they also set it up in a tiered fashion so that any LED light that you put in that ranged from zero to 50 watts would be billed at 25 watts. From 51 watts to 100 watts would be billed at 75 watts and so forth. Now, although that looks fine on the surface, the issue with it was that if you look at the, the number of street lights in, in National Grid Service Territory, 62% of them are 50 watt fixtures which the correct replacement of is a 19 or 15 watt fixture. So that meant those 15 and 19 watt fixtures, which represent the largest portion, would be billed at 25 watts. So you would be overpaying by about 23%. NGRID, as a part of these negotiations, has agreed to increase the number of tiers to eliminate that problem. So we've overcome that. All of this has happened just since November. Um, and there's an, the other issue, of course, is that they don't have any provisions right now for intelligent controls or for other devices that might be attached to the MASTAR. One of the options that you have when you convert to LED lighting, because you can turn an LED light off and turn it on instantaneously, that you cannot do with your current lighting system. Those, as you know, when you turn off the lights in a gym, it takes 15 minutes or something for them to come back on. So you don't have that ability. You don't have the ability to dim them. But with, with LED technology, you can turn them on and off instantly. You can dim them uh, all the way down to 10% if you like. So what this offers for the city is the option to have an intelligent control that lets you, after certain hours of the day, turn the lights down or even turn them off if they're not required. 
It also provides you immediate feedback as to if, if a streetlight is not functioning. So instead of having to drive around or wait for somebody to report it, the streetlight reports itself. So that means you can do targeted repairs. Um, another advantage of LED technology is the improved color rendering. So from a police safety standpoint, their ability to identify car colors, uh, clothing colors, and those sorts of things is greatly improved under LED technology. Um, and they use about 50, less than 50% uh, of the energy of the, of the light they're going to replace. So you're going to see, uh, when you take all of this into account, about a 67, uh, uh, about a 55 to 60% reduction in your energy. That's about uh, 2.8 million kilowatt hours a year. And it was, will result in about a $400,000 a year savings. You're going to get the 10-year warranty, so you have no costs associated with the replacement of a fixture for the next 10 years except for the labor costs associated with putting it up, taking down the broken one, putting up the new one. The expectation and, the, and so far what the experience has been in Los Angeles, in the city of Boston, and other communities that have done this is that your repair rate will go from about 18% per year to less than half a percent. So your system becomes more reliable and your citizens will feel better about it. Now, the, the control systems that turn the lights on and off are designed to do just that, to control the light. What we're looking at as a company is going way beyond that. If you're going to establish a communication platform between the city and the light to control it, what if we made that platform sufficiently robust to support other things? What if you had a neighborhood where you wanted the police wanted to put a camera up and monitor that neighborhood? Why can't we build a system that would support that? If you wanted to connect your traffic signals Right now, you have two choices if you want to synchronize traffic signals. You either run a wire to every traffic signal in the city and bring it back to your control center, or you do it on a, on a wireless basis and it's line of sight. So if there's an intersection around the corner, you're not going to talk to it. So you have to have a separate system for that one. And the, the beauty of this is, is if we built a communication system that's robust enough, the traffic signal only has to see the nearest street light. So your ability to synchronize your your traffic signals throughout the city becomes a, a much less expensive proposition and allows you to help move traffic. Um, if, if the uh, Homeland Security wanted to look for radioactive materials that are being transported through your city, they could put, you could get them to give you a grant to put a device up that communicates through your streetlight that's going to look for those types of things. You want to monitor traffic flow, you can put those devices up there, so on and so forth. So what you're beginning to see is a lot of folks are talking about this. Nobody's actually doing it yet. We're going to do it. Um, Cisco and uh, IBM have talked about smart cities and, and trying to ca uh, gather all of this data. They don't know how to go about it yet. But we're, what we're suggesting to you is that you can, within the savings that you'll generate through this project, include the cost of putting in this communication system. Now, you won't get any benefit of it. From, benefit from it until National Grid adopts a tariff that will support it. They are agreeing right now to doing pilot programs in Rhode Island. And we're in the process of pushing them to do some pilot programs up here in um, Massachusetts. And they've been in communication with uh, some of the control companies, uh, in particular uh, SunTech, which is located here in uh, Raynham, uh, about these devices and how to go about doing these pilots. It would be wonderful if Brockton could be one of those early pilots uh, so that you could see an immediate benefit from the dimming capability and so on and so forth. So what is this going to cost? The cost of the city is going to be somewhere around $4.5 million. I, I think that figure is a bit high, but I would rather overestimate the cost and underestimate the savings and have it come in with the cost down and the savings higher. Um, a lot of that is going to depend on the bids. We know that NGRID is offering incentives for, this, for the town of Easton. They had a small project that was about uh, $56,000 to do 146 lights as a pilot. They got a grant of $25,000. So we've heard that they'll give grants up to almost 50%. I don't believe that in the case of a $4.5 million project. I think that's just too big a bite for them. So I have used uh, 25 cents per kilowatt hour saved, which is what NSTAR is doing because I assume that Net National Grid will at least match the incentives being provided by uh, NSTAR. But they could give us a grant upwards to $1.2 million. I hope to get a, 
better handle on this just within the next few weeks because we have applied for a grant for the town of Randolph who is going to be doing this. Also, the city of Fitchburg is going to be doing this. The city of Cambridge is going to be doing this. That is putting in the intelligent control systems because they want to have themselves in a position to be ready to take advantage of both the dimming and the added capabilities that a smart and uh, robust communication platform can provide. Uh, your return on the investment is seven to nine years, and the beauty of all of this is it can be financed through the savings at no cost to the city. In fact, we should be able to generate a savings in your budget every year as a result of the project. The way we finance these is through a tax-exempt municipal lease. Um, so what that does is it's an annual, it, it's in the, in the annual appropriation. It has no obligation beyond the current fiscal year. So it has no impact on your bond rating or your le debt levy limit. And you have the ability, if at some point in the near future you do a large bond and you want to roll the payoff of this project into that bond, you can do that. And then this, the savings from the streetlight help pay for the future bond because you're doing this on a short term, the bonds are typically done on long term, and the payback on this project is so high. So this is, this is the direction that we actually talked about doing uh, three years ago. And now the, the, the la landscape has changed to the point where the prices of these products have come down sufficiently, and the efficiency of them has gone up sufficiently to make it very cost effective. And a number of cities are starting to do this uh, in the Commonwealth. Mr. Woodbury, I, I, first of all, I want to thank you. I know you flew in to Massachusetts to be here tonight, and we appreciate that. And, and exactly what you just said, about three years ago, um, at that time, I called it phase one. The first phase was to have the city for $44,000 acquire the streetlights, and they did do that. And of course, you know, it was new, so we needed to kind of iron out some of the, uh, some of the wrinkles that popped up, but, but there's been some real money uh, savings, and I know Mr. Conan has said that uh, here, here before us as well. Um, you know, phase two we talked about three years ago would be this LED, and since that time, I mean, the technology and the enhancements have just grown. Um, I mean, you look at Mayor Walsh right now in Boston, he's doing a pilot program with Wi-Fi in certain areas of the city. I mean, we could do that here in Brockton as well with this capability. You know, when you hear four, four and a half million bucks, that's a lot of money during tough times, but then when you hear that there's no upfront cost because it's gonna be uh, washed through the savings, that's when you really have to open up your eyes. Um, the true benefit, and, and, and I heard your um, presentation in Randolph, and, and I, I know some people in Cambridge that have talked to me as well, um, the true benefit is to take advantage of the free money, the grant money from the utilities, because we don't know when that's going to disappear. And, uh, you know, I, 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 I really uh, respect Mr. Condon and his expertise on, on money. So I'd like to, if I could, um, have Jay, uh, Mr. Condon, if you could um, <laughs> maybe give your, your thoughts on this as well. And we'll, we'll come back to you as well, Mr. Woodbury. Mr. Condon, good evening. Good evening. What are your thoughts on this, Jay? Well, I think, um, you know, we worked with Mr. Woodbury before. Uh, and as you know, we, you helped us set the thing up. You know, he, know, he knows his business. He does a very good job. Uh, the difficulty in the first project wasn't working with Mr. Woodbury. It was working with National Grid. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sure he knows that. Uh, in fact, we're still having troubles uh, with National Grid on that first project because they changed some accounts on us. We're having a hard, they're hard to get to move. I have no problem with this concept at all. I've got no problem with saving money in the city budget. Uh, you know, it's, um, it was something we even looked at uh, three years ago, right. whether we should have gone ahead at that point, decided not to. I think maybe it's probably wise that we did wait, but I've got no problem with working with Mr. Woodbury to take, take a, a, doesn't seem to want to stop, to take a look at this um, municipal leasing uh, approach make certain that we've identified the savings so that the least cost in the annual budget is, you know, is offset by the savings and, and more, and, and go ahead with it. I think there's, uh, there's no reason not to, except uh, that a lot of this does seem to be contingent upon the actions of the utility, you know, adopting a different tariff, being willing to work with us with grants, and I'd like to see them take some steps to fix the billing mess they've created right. for us for the last Yeah, they, they kind of changed the game on us mid, mid, did, yeah. midstream, yeah. but... Um, yeah. I, thank you for that, Jay. I appreciate that. And, Mr. And, Mr. Uh, Woodbury knows his, knows his business very, very well. We, you know. he, he absolutely does. And, and uh, you know, I, I, one, one thing, and I'll open up to my, my colleagues, Mr. Woodbury. Thank you, Mr. Okay. Conant. Um, Mr. Woodbury, you, you mentioned the concept of dimming the lights, but you could also do the opposite effect in a, in a, in a 
crime-ridden area or potentially uh, law enforcement, you could actually turn the lights up. Isn't that correct? That's correct. Uh, you could also use the lights to guide your police or your fire department. So you can make an individual light flash. If you had to evacuate the city, you could make the lights flash in sequence so that it guided people down the route you wanted them to use. I mean, you know, when you start thinking about the street light not as roadway lighting, but as a piece of real estate that sits 30 feet above the pavement in the middle of the roadway and has power to it 24 seven, and you ask yourself, what can I do with that piece of real estate? The fact is the, the telephone companies are getting away from putting up these fake Christmas trees and flagpoles because it's just too expensive and takes too long to get those approved. They're going now with microcells to transmit to get 4G. That costs them about $4,500 per installation. If the city owned that little piece of real estate and could let them attach to that, well, you could rent that space to them. My long-term goal is to take your streetlights out of a budget line item and make it a revenue producer. And I think you know, one of the things we've done is we've tried to look around the country. There's a lot of companies that provide these controls. We've identified the only company in the country that uses an IP address for each streetlight, which opens up your ability to do lots of other things. And so what we've been identifying is an open protocol, not some proprietary system that's going to be a problem for you when that company is no longer supporting it, like Windows XP, um, and that would allow your streetlight system to be much like your cell phone, where people can develop apps use their imagination, and then apply that app to your streetlight to help with city processes. And we think to not have that capability built in while you have the funds available to do it, and we know that we're going to have this in place within the next two years, at worst case, three years, the ability to dim the lights and get the savings from that. Um, why would you invest in this and then three years from now when you've got a light that's expected to last 20 years, you're going to have to take it down and put up a different one? Why not make the investment today and, and be ready? The other thing that we know is coming down the pike is what's called FirstNet. Now, your police department will be familiar with this, but there's a billions of dollars set aside by the federal government to integrate the communication between your first responders. Call FirstNet. In uh, 2018, grants are going to be available to support those programs. If the city already has a basic platform in place, don't you think they're going to move to the head of the line? when it comes to getting those grants, because they're going to be able to do more with less. So all of this is thinking about where, do we, where are we today and where do we want to be five years from today, and, and what's the best way to position ourselves to optimize our benefits in five years? And this is what we think is the right thing to do. Mr. Now, Woodbury, before I just have a quick question for the mayor, but before that, in, in terms of um, the grant, uh, the utilities grant funding, isn't that a creature of the legislature? Isn't that, isn't that mandated that they have to come up with some type of dough for the municipalities? That's correct. The state legislature uh, determines the, the funds that are going to be contributed, and they, they're the ones that ensure that this program continues. OK. Uh, just this past August, they have uh, significantly ramped up the amount that's going to be applied to the um, SREC program for photovoltaics uh, solar panels. And, and that shows their commitment to this conservation. Thank you. Uh, so I, I expect their grants to continue for a while, uh, although there's always a risk that it doesn't get approved. We've got to beat him to the punch. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Woodbury. Mr. Mayor, I just had a quick question. I know, Mr. Mayor, you and I have chatted about this in the past, um, kind of offline briefly, and I, I, I know you, uh, you're interested in it as well. Do, do you think this is something that, you know, I called it phase one. The first one was the acquisition under Mayor Bell's audience. This would be phase two. Is this something that you, you think has some teeth to it and some reality? I, I think down the road, Councillor, it does. I'm, I'm not sure about the timing of it, um, and I'm still learning about it, quite honestly. Uh, there are a couple other firms uh, like this one that have been in to make presentations to me. One firm, I can't remember their name, they've, they've done like the whole state of New Jersey, and they kind of did the, the solar panels first and then the lights, but the same idea of the solar panels on the light poles and then the ability to do high-speed communication, you know, from the same spot. Um, so, I mean, I, I think the possibilities are endless. I think we're still, um, I think we've still got some work to do to complete the, you know, the acquisition of the lights themselves. But um, I'm open-minded to continuing the discussion, Councillor. Thank you. That sounds great, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. 
With that, Mr. Chairman, I would open it up to my colleagues. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Stewart, you had a question? I, I do. Uh, Mr. Woodbury, so uh, first I want to thank my colleague, Councillor Sullivan, for um, bringing this before us and his work on this particular initiative. Um, whatever the number of phases there may be, I'm glad that, that you're focused on it. I was really intrigued by your comment around um, synchronizing traffic lights. And one of the most frustrating things in the city is getting from one side of Brockton to the other and it taking like almost an hour, partly because of just there's no rhyme or reason to how the traffic system is structured. Um, and so are there places, and so if we could cut the commute time down in the city, I think that would be a big victory for residents and businesses because it's important to have a, you know, an efficient flow of traffic through your city and that also adds to positive commerce. So are there examples of cities taking advantage of that technology and not just synchronous, because I would imagine at some point you can be able to instantaneously monitor traffic flow and adjust traffic lights based on demand on each street, right? That's correct. Now, this is currently being done, but, but what you see out there is these stovepipe systems. So you have like Eagle, produces their system for, for managing their traffic signals, and you build that system and it operates independently of everything else. And there's a big expense associated with installing that. Uh, traffic monitoring devices, that's different too. So what we're talking about is building a common platform that they can all talk to so that you can reduce the cost of adding these capabilities throughout the city. Right, I understand. Has that been done before in, in, no. in the- It's being yeah. done in Europe. I see. Um, but it's n not being done here. So City of Paris, for example, is, is doing a system right now. City of Oslo uh, is, is it Oslo uh, or, uh, Co I'm sorry, Copenhagen. Copenhagen in Denmark is doing this. And the Europeans are ahead of us on, on this. And you mentioned so um, open source or crowdsourcing kind of technology. So that means that if they're, I'm just not, I'm not understanding the economics of it. So if it's open source, it would be developed by the public and then used by the city or is it, would there be? It, it would work like your cell phone where, where you have a certain communication protocol and there's actually a group called TALQ, uh, which is looking at doing a uh, universal standard across uh, all countries in, in, the, in the whole world. Because one of the issues you have is companies like Rome have a proprietary system. And uh, if they're not supporting that proprietary system, you're kind of stuck. Mm -hmm. And then you have to pay for it. Uh, uh, there are other companies that also have these systems, but you have to pay some substantial fees for, those, for the right to use their, their software. And what we want to do is build a software that essentially belongs to you, and it, it follows the TALQ uh, protocols. And, and allows for others to develop uh, the ability to communicate through that system to do various things for you. I see. And my last question, I mean, this, the lighting piece is, is uh, interesting, but re what really piqued my interest was the way to, to try to control traffic flow. And I'm also assuming then that emergency responders could use the same system so that they could direct which lights were green or red based on the travels of a fire truck, right? Preemption. Yeah. Right. Yeah, okay. I, I'm working with the city of Omaha. They have 900 signalized intersections and 57,000 streetlights uh, to do this very same thing. I see. Great. All right. Thank you for the presentation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I might also. mention uh, the, the company that was referred to as Petrosolar, uh, and I'm very familiar with them. Okay. They put 140,000 units of these solar panels down in New Jersey. The system would be compatible with that. I see. In fact, they, they wanted me to partner with them, but I, I decided not to do that. Very good. Thank, thank you. you. Any other questions, comments from counselors? Mr. Woodbury, I, again, I want to thank you for uh, coming to Brockton. And, and you may recall three years ago when I said this, Brockton's the city of champions. Of course, Thomas Edison came here. His building was right next door here. Brockton was the first electric street light in the nation and the first electrified uh, fire station in the nation. So we like to be at the cutting edge in the forefront. So again, thank you for your presentation. It's always uh, good to hear your insights, your expertise. I want to thank the mayor and Mr. Carnan as well. With that, I want to make a favorable recommendation back to the full city Second. council. Second. Motion's been made and seconded and sent back to the full city council with a favorable recommendation. All in favor? Opposed? So be it. We thank Councilor Sullivan well. for bringing this before us uh, this evening. Next item, Madam Clerk. Resolved that the mayor, chiefs of the city public safety departments, the chief financial officer, and the chairman of the board of assessors be invited to appear before a committee of this council to discuss the impact upon the city in providing such essential services to nonprofits 
the community benefits to the city resulting from the mission of the nonprofits and to review ways to strengthen the partnership between the city and its tax exempt institutions. Invited Honorable oh. Mayor Bill Carpenter, John A. Condon, Chief Financial Officer, Richard C. Francis, Fire Chief, Robert Hayden, Interim Chief of Police, and Paul Sullivan, Assessor's Chairman. Council Cruz. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I make a motion to postpone this till the next finance meeting. Second. Second. Motion is made properly, second to postpone the next FinCom. All in favor, please raise your hand. All opposed, a motion carries. It's postponed the next finance. Number 18, Madam Clerk. Resolved that the city's chief financial officer, solicitor, and treasurer collect to come before the finance committee to discuss payment in lieu of taxes, the pilot programs, and how they may be implemented between the city and certain non-tax paying entities located within Brockton. Uh, Council Cruz. Uh, I'd also make a motion to postpone this to the next finance meeting. Second. Motion is made properly second to postpone this, number 18, to the next event. Come on, in favor, please raise your hand. I'll oppose that motion carries. Uh, Councilors, uh, two, two things I want to congratulate. Uh, the Keith Park Association, they had their first annual uh, Easter egg hunt. I was there, the mayor was there, I know Councilor Dubois was there, I'm sure there was others I didn't see. Councilor Stadensky. Councilor Stadensky was there as well. It was a huge turnout. It was an awesome event in the city of Brockton. Uh, it really was beneficial to the kids. I, uh, I want to uh, give a special thanks to, uh, to Lynn Smith, Cindy Koska, and Tina Jones. I know there's others uh, that spent many, many hours, but I know those three ladies were really dedicated to the cause, and next year is either going to be better. I also want to uh, congratulate and thank Richard Hand Jr. Again, he did his annual coin event at the main library, and I was there, and, and Council Stewart was there. Uh, I know uh, uh, Rep. Uh, Brady was there. I'm sure there was others there as well. Um, it was really educational. Uh, Richard dresses the part with the top hat. He looks like Abe Lincoln, a skinny version with no beard. It was very informative. And there was, uh, what do you think, Jace? Five or six students, there were five or six young kids that did projects based on, on coins. And it was just awesome. So again, shout out to that. Those are the good things the city of Brockton. Anything else before us tonight? I was Cruz. a personal privilege. I'd just like to point out, we have a very special visitor with us here tonight, representing the city of Chelsea. He's done a great job sitting there all night. <laughs> Councilor Stewart's nephew, Roberto, has been sitting there patiently. Yay! Great job all night. Thank, Thank you. Thank you for being here. Anything <laughs> else? Councilor Azak. I just want to remind everybody that there's a meeting this Thursday evening in the GAR room at 6 p.m. for Keep Brockton Beautiful. Thank you, Councilor. Seeing uh, no, nothing else before us, this meeting is here by adjourned.